what are the chances this is actually working right now? Um, if you're seeing me live on my Facebook page, then we have overcome the bugs and the glitches in Facebook Live. And uh, I want to apologize for the delay in getting our online office hours started this week. Um, I have learned that Facebook Live can be really challenging and in like different ways every week. So uh, I hope we're working now and I want to thank you for your patience and for sticking with us because we really want to get this, uh, get this started. So if you're logging in to my online office hours for the first time, it's pretty simple. The way this goes is I spend a little bit of time telling you what I've been up to uh, in the past several days. I might talk about a few things that are on my mind and then quickly we're going to go to your questions. So be ready. You can start sending in those questions in the, uh, the comment section for uh, Facebook as you're watching us. Uh, or I think you, you may have also received a special email account that we've set up to get questions. And, and we have a few of those that we've gotten over the last few days that'll get us started in this conversation. So what have I been doing these last uh, few days? First of all, we took a big vote in the House of Representatives last Friday. I did fly back again to the Capitol. Uh, flying is a real journey these days. If you don't have to fly, don't do it. I was packed into uh, an airplane that where everyone was wearing masks, but there were no vacant seats, and uh, it didn't feel entirely safe. Uh, many of you, I suspect, would be very uncomfortable in that situation. So just know that if you've heard from the airlines that they're leaving middle seats open, they're not. Uh, they're packing the planes, and it, it's a little uncomfortable. Anyway, uh, the bill we voted for is a big one, and it's called the HEROES Act. I'll tell you a little bit about that, but first let me just tell you why it's different than some of the other big votes I've taken in the wake of this pandemic. Uh, for the last several big vote packages, we have basically had deals cut between Mitch McConnell, Nancy Pelosi, and Steve Mnuchin on behalf of the administration, and then we've been presented with final packages and you know we've had to choose do we vote yes or no this is much more of a ground up piece of legislation from house democrats we wanted to get back to something more like regular order of the house where we actually help shape legislation and put it forward and the negotiations happen after these bills come forward and so that's what we did and that's why you see a number of really top priorities for me and my colleagues in this legislation. Maybe one of the most important is immediate and substantial support for states and local governments and tribal governments that are reeling right now. In, in a short period of time, states like California have gone from having a budget surplus to having one of the most severe budget deficits they've ever had to confront. And if we don't provide federal help, that's the only place they can turn. States can't print money, they can't deficit spend. So if we don't provide a federal backstop right away, you're going to see massive layoffs at state and local government. And what that means is it's going to be really hard to reopen our schools and make them safe. You can't do that if you're having massive layoffs of teachers and support staff. It means other critical services, including public health uh, and other public safety and sanitation, other things we count on, are going to suffer. And you're going to have another uh, ripple of economic devastation caused in the public sector as a result of all of this. And frankly, the crisis is going to get worse uh, if, if we allow that to happen. So state and local and tribal government support, certainly the centerpiece of this HEROES Act. And then hazard pay for the essential workers that are being required to show up, put themselves at risk. This certainly includes healthcare workers, but it's more than that. It's the folks in grocery stores and other places that we have deemed essential where we know people are putting themselves at risk and frankly the burdens are being borne disproportionately by communities of color that often do this work and they're taking that exposure to the virus back to their own families and in many cases they live in, in dense housing arrangements with large family groups and so uh, it is really risky for us to allow the virus to continue to spread and not to provide more support, certainly with protective equipment, but also I think hazard pay is appropriate uh, for these folks. Um, we put more money into the small business tools that we've made available, the Paycheck Protection Program and uh, the, the loan and grant programs through the SBA. These are not perfect tools and I'm gonna keep working on some better alternatives, frankly, than pushing money 
through third party banks and lenders to the small businesses and nonprofits that need them. But uh, it is important that we keep that funding available for now, and, and we've done that uh, in the HEROES Act. Just two more pieces I'll mention. Uh, election protection. We know that this pandemic will be with us in November uh, when we're trying to have a national election. So we want to give states the support they need to do what California has done, to make available for every voter the option to vote safely at home using the mail-in ballot. Um, and that, don't, that only works if you have a post office that's still open and functioning. So the last piece I'll mention in the HEROES Act is support for the Postal Service without any trap doors or uh, policy hijacking that we've seen proposed from President Trump, where he wants to kind of get back at Jeff Bezos by jacking up package delivery fees at the Postal Service. We need to support the Postal Service, and this bill does that. It's not perfect. Uh, but I, I'm really pleased to be able to push something forward that reflects my priorities and my values. Everyone understands that there will need to be more negotiations. The Senate and the administration uh, will have something to say about all this. But um, we think we've advanced the conversation. And I think we've put some pressure, frankly, on the Senate, on the administration. When they say we need to take a pause and just let things play out, well, we're saying we disagree. We see an immediate, urgent crisis. You know, uh, over 38 million Americans have now filed for unemployment insurance. That means that we've got at least 40 million people that are effectively out of work or underemployed in this country. That is absolutely a crisis, and that's not taking a pause or waiting for Congress to figure out what to do. That's happening right now. We're approaching 100,000 deaths as a result of this COVID-19 pandemic. And we're seeing hospitalizations and other complications popping up in the Midwest and in the South and many other parts of the country. Uh, if we don't do more to continue to push money out to our frontline health workers and public health um, capacities, even places that have done a great job flattening the curve, like my part of California, are going to be at risk by these outbreaks that will take place in other parts of the country and people will move around and goods will move around and we'll see backsliding if we don't stay on top of this. So um, we're going to keep pushing. And I'm pleased that instead of waiting for that deal to be cut behind closed doors, we're playing a little bit of offense here, trying to drive the conversation. I think that was the right thing to do. Uh, lastly, we changed the rules of the House. I've been pushing this for a long time. Uh, recognizing that we'll probably be under the cloud of this pandemic for quite some time. It's time to modernize. It's time to allow uh, remote participation by way of video and hearings so we can get Congress back on the field. Uh, it was not easy to get the, uh, the ossified institution of the House of Representatives to change its rules and to do what everyone else around the world is finding ways to do, to adapt to these difficult realities. But we did it. And we will soon start to see more oversight and more legislative function because we modified those rules. I got a little head start on that um, on Monday by having a virtual hearing uh, at my subcommittee, Wash Water, Oceans, and Wildlife. And we held that hearing on um, the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on fishing communities. Really an important thing for me, representing a lot of working waterfronts and people who make their living on the water. Uh, but also important to many coastal communities around this country. And the truth is, um, this is having a unique impact on the people who do the fishing and the processors and others that are part of this industry, also on our entire seafood supply chain that depends so heavily on restaurants, which are not accepting uh, the products anymore. And, and all of the distribution networks are set up to move a lot of our seafood through restaurants. Uh, we need to think creatively about direct-to-consumer alternatives, and we need to move some disaster funding out to these communities very quickly. So we were able to talk about all of that. I had hoped it would be a bipartisan virtual hearing, uh, and right up to the last minute, I had interest from a bunch of Republican colleagues who were enthusiastic, but um, their leadership um, put out uh, a, a ruling for their members not to participate, discourage them, and even threaten them uh, if they did participate. And as a result, we had to move forward with that hearing without my Republican colleagues. But I'm going to keep trying, and we're going to have to figure out a way to work together using 
remote technology and get Congress back on the field. So uh, those are some of the things I'm working on, some of the things that are on my mind. Let's go to your questions. Uh, Jenny Calloway, my district director, is going to read them out to me uh, from a safe distance. Okay, the first question is from Howard, and he wants to know how you propose to protect small coastal communities from large numbers of visitors during the pandemic. Thanks for the question, Howard. Um, so I will not be the one in position to protect these coastal communities. Our, our local public health authorities really are gonna be calling the shots on what is allowed and what is not. And you know, I represent six counties up and down the Northern California coast. For the most part, they're in sync with each other, but I am seeing some, some differences uh, in the way they are opening up and the things that they're doing with respect to parks and public open spaces and beaches. So Mendocino County, for example, has taken uh, some significant steps towards reopening and allowing folks back out into these places. Sonoma County uh, has not, and definitely wants to keep its beaches closed through Memorial Day. My understanding is that Marin County will continue to have beaches and most parks uh, closed to vehicle traffic, at least through Memorial Day. But if you're fortunate enough to be able to walk or bike into those facilities, you can do it. So we've just got slightly uh, different standards in these different places, and you're gonna have to check with your own local county public health order and, and that department to find out exactly what's allowed and what is not allowed. The one thing that I believe continues to be prohibited is unnecessary travel. And that's by virtue of the state order from Gavin Newsom. So it is still not okay to pack up your family and drive long distances uh, into crowded beaches. And uh, we may well need our local enforcement authorities to, uh, to enforce that when you think about a busy time like Memorial Day weekend. Okay, Christine wants to know if you could please help casino workers who refuse to return to the casinos now, now and, and we don't want them to lose their unemployment. Can you help them? Right, so some casinos in, in more rural areas are starting to reopen, and uh, I, I appreciate this question very much. Uh, I will certainly support anyone who feels like it's unsafe for them to show up and do their job. Um, whether that means they'll be able to stay on unemployment or not is going to depend on how the state of California is interpreting and, and implementing the rules. And so I don't want to uh, I don't want to speak without precise knowledge on this because uh, I can tell that you're impacted by this and we want to get you really good information. But I would check with uh, EDD to find out exactly whether you would be able to hang on to your unemployment benefits if you felt for your own safety you needed to not go back to work. Uh, and my office would be happy to work with you. Uh, if you're in Humboldt County, my Eureka office uh, is available. The number is right here on my website or my Facebook page that you're viewing right now. So uh, give a call and, and we'll try to help out. Okay, uh, Lisa wants to know, will businesses be provided masks for public use so that, they, so that customers may go back and shop? Well, they certainly should do that. Masking is something that at every level, public health experts are telling us we're, we're gonna need to continue to do, even as we start to reopen. Um, I'm not aware of any federal government provision of masks to people. Everyone is, for the most part, on their own to go out and find their own facial coverings or masks and, and to do that. Uh, public employees uh, are another story, and I think there will be support uh, certainly with federal employees, and I know states and local governments are making an effort also to make sure that their personnel have that equipment. Do you have any uh, rough idea of when domestic air travel should reopen? Well, domestic air travel is reopened. It's happening right now. You're not supposed to do it unless you absolutely have to. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned at the outset of this uh, discussion, it's not, a, it's not a pleasant way of traveling right now. Most of the airport is still shut down, so it's very hard to get food and amenities. There's long lines. There's very few flights, and they are packing those flights. Uh, how soon it gets back to normal you know, probably depends on um, 
how people respond. And uh, I'm a little bit worried because, you know, air travel is inherently a crowding kind of situation. I'm a little worried we're going to find that by packing people into planes and forcing them to jam into long lines to get food at airports, um, we may well see some more outbreaks uh, as a result of that. Okay, a number of people are asking about public education and want to know what are your thoughts on the upcoming budget cuts to public education in California, especially in Sonoma County due to the current COVID crisis? Well, thanks. And it's not just Sonoma County. It's, it's all around the state of California where people are bracing for huge uh, state cuts. Uh, my own wife is a public school teacher and uh, believe me, you know, the, the worries are everywhere about layoffs. So um, what am I doing? That HEROES Act I told you about a moment ago is the main thing I'm doing, pushing out hundreds of billions of dollars to state governments. And education is probably one of the biggest parts of why we need to do that. And it's, it's more than just because we should. We should support public schools. But look, if you want to have any chance of safely reopening the economy, you need the schools to reopen. And if you're going to have any chance of that, They've got to be safe. You can't do that while you're slashing the ranks of teachers and support staff. You're going to need more bodies, more teachers, more um, para professionals and support staff because you want smaller class sizes to make them safe. You're going to have to adapt facilities, maybe add some new facilities in order to spread people out and make it all work. So we're going in exactly the wrong direction if we want this reopening of the economy to actually work. We need safe schools and we can't have massive cuts and layoffs if we're gonna achieve safe schools. So that's uh, how I view it, and one of the reasons I feel so strongly about providing that support to state government from the federal level, which is the only place they can get help right now. Great, so Lucia wants to know, thank you, Congressman, for all your, for all your work. What are your efforts? What efforts are you making to ensure that mixed status families yeah. don't get left out of the economic relief measures from the federal government? and how are Democrats supporting families who haven't been able to benefit from the last stimulus package? That's a great question uh, because, uh, you know, by now I'm told 75% of the families that are entitled to that direct stimulus payment from Treasury, you know, the one that includes the special letter from Donald Trump, um, <laughs> by now 75% uh, of the people I'm told have gotten that money, and, and that's great. That comes at an important time for them. However, if you are a legal immigrant, that happens to not be a citizen, but you have a child who is a citizen, that child cannot get the five or $600 that they're entitled to under the CARES Act because the citizenship status of their parents, lack of citizenship status, precludes them under the way the law was written. That is not okay. And uh, I think it's discriminatory. I think it's unconscionable that you have a U.S. citizen child in one household treated totally differently than a U.S. citizen child in the house right next door. So uh, we fix that in the HEROES Act. We change that. And of course, some of our Republican colleagues are politicizing that as they do on anything relating to immigration. Uh, but it's the right thing to do. Uh, any kid who is a U.S. citizen needs to get the same benefit afforded to every other U.S. citizen. Okay, PJ wants to know, I hear there was a fire in San Rafael yesterday evening. Is coronavirus affecting our emergency responders? Well, certainly our emergency responders uh, are at risk. They have to respond to that fire in San Rafael and to every car wreck and other incident that calls them out. And, you know, they come in touch with people and they have to go into uh, houses and property to respond to emergencies. So uh, they really are on the front line. It's, that's why it's so critical that we give them the protective equipment that they need, that they have priority for testing, and we still don't have anywhere close to the testing capacity that we need to see. And it's also why I believe uh, they're entitled to some hazard pay. Okay, speaking of testing, there's a number of people asking here, when are we going to get adequate testing and how do you think testing can be addressed? I wish I had a good answer for you because adequate testing is so critical to our ability to restore some normalcy and, and get back to um, the, the lives we all want to be living. We're not there. And uh, the main reason we're not there is the bungled response from the federal government. And, you know, we could talk all day long about that. 
from the initial mishandling of testing by the CDC, their own bungled test, their refusal to get labs involved all over this country early on, uh, the refusal to use the proven international tests that other countries were using, uh, all of it combined to set us back months on having the testing we needed to get an early jump on this virus. And you saw some alarming numbers today. If we had simply put our uh, distancing and other measures in place two weeks earlier, we would have avoided something like 75, 80% of the deaths that we've seen in this country. If we'd gone earlier than that, it would have been an even greater reduction. So we would not be uh, in this terrible situation we find ourselves, and that is largely because of the failed national response. So where are we right now? Uh, the administration has stubbornly refused to change course. They continue to believe that states and local governments and every hospital and clinic in this country is essentially on their own. And instead of a, a nationally driven, coordinated testing initiative, uh, they consider themselves to be playing a backup role, which really is chaotic and no one really knows what it means. There's no single person in charge. The worst part of it is uh, they've got the one tool that could fix this. It's, it's a law called the Defense Production Act where they could literally commandeer manufacturing capacity in this country for swabs and other collection equipment, but also for the testing itself, for the tests. They could take over manufacturing capacity at one of these pharmaceutical companies, pay them fair market value for it, but make sure that there won't be price gouging and there won't be shortages. They refuse to do that. And as a result, uh, we have the kind of chaos and the catch-up game that we continue to see. Um, it's worse than that because we've gotten a steady stream of broken promises and lies from this administration, including constantly holding out these shiny objects that are supposed to save the day, the new Abbott test, uh, which turns out to not be very accurate. It actually doesn't work well at all, especially for people that are asymptomatic. That's why the White House is a hotbed of coronavirus among their staff because they've been relying exclusively on this Abbott test because the president is very close to the CEO of that company. So uh, it's a mess. And I think until we can persuade the administration to change course, um, it's gonna remain a mess and states are gonna be uh, competing with themselves and everyone else to try to come up with testing. I will say that the HEROES Act, once again, uh, pushes the administration to do the right thing on the Defense Production Act, on maintaining a national plan uh, for PPE and testing. And we wanna do that because we gotta address the chaos of all that, but we need to get ahead of all that same chaos happening when it come comes time for a vaccine. Now, all of us are really hopeful that there really is a vaccine that will be safe and widely available sometime in the next year or two. But if we approach it the same way that we have with this administration and testing, uh, I think you can expect chaos and shortages, and we're not gonna get the benefits of the kind of universal, affordable, accessible vaccine that we need. So all of that is in the HEROES Act. Very long-winded answer, I apologize. <laughs> but I'm, I'm trying to convey the complexity of the challenge and the fact that we haven't yet been able to prevail upon President Trump and his administration to do the right thing. Well, this is related. Greg Krauss wants to know, is there something Congress, the House or the Senate, can do to mandate the president fund the World Health Organization? Well, we can try. Um, the president does have some discretion uh, with respect to uh, aid and funding that we allocate to, uh, to change it if circumstances change. And of course, right now he's arguing that there's this crisis of confidence with the World Health Organization that requires him to uh, threaten to withhold funding. I think what you'll probably see uh, as we move to appropriations bills and, and you know, whatever government funding bill we put in place this fall, I'm sure we'll put money forward for the World Health Organization. Most of us believe that that's critical, especially right now in the middle of this global pandemic. And I hope we'll be able to make it really prescriptive so that the administration can't play games with it. Uh, but I think you've seen how the, how the Trump administration approaches this. They are playing politics here, where instead of uh, having people talk about their failed response to the pandemic, they want people talking about China and conspiracy theories and uh, the World Health Organization as some sort of a boogeyman. So we got our work cut out for us in that regard. 
Okay, Pat wants to know, can you speak a little more about the election, about election protection? What can the federal government do to move us towards all vote by mail elections? The federal government can put the resources on the table that states need in order to do this. And that's what we did in the HEROES Act. It, it costs a lot of money uh, to move to an entirely uh, mail-in ballot. And it needs to start happening right now because November is not that far away. Uh, and then we can also provide some direction for certain standards that have to be met. And uh, all of that is in the HEROES Act. But what we can't do probably is force the Senate and the president to go along with this. We're going to have a fight on our hands. And uh, I'm going to keep pushing because I believe our, our democracy is vital. I want more people to vote, not fewer people. Uh, unfortunately, not everyone sees it that way. Jerry wants to know, do you support eliminating the Electoral College and instead use the popular vote for national elections? Sure. I'd be happy to get rid of the Electoral College. It's undemocratic. It's anachronistic. It uh, is a, a residual from uh, another time early in our country's founding when because of slavery and all sorts of other considerations, um, compromises were made. Uh, and we've seen that uh, two of the last three elections were decided in favor of a candidate who lost the national popular vote. So um, that is a big problem. And I, I think increasingly uh, we're, we're going to see a restlessness in the rest of the country if we continue to see electoral college uh, disparities from the national popular vote. Now, making it, changing it is, is a lot harder than talking about it. Uh, you have to amend the Constitution. And I'll be honest with you, that's going to be really hard to do because all of these states that are benefiting from you know, having the advantage of the Electoral College would have to go along with a national popular vote, and, and they're not going to do that anytime soon. Okay, uh, Lisa wants to know, what about essential workers that are not health care workers? Will they receive benefits? These are people working in grocery stores, law offices. Yes, short answer, yes. Under the HEROES Act, they would. Okay. Um, PJ wants to know, do you think President Trump will sign the HEROES Act? What's the Democratic Party's plan to draw Republicans to the table? He's certainly not going to sign it in its current form. And look, we've got our eyes wide open. We weren't born yesterday. Um, but I also think when he makes these uh, pronouncements about dead on arrival and we're not going to do anything more, uh, you just can't take these absolute statements by the president seriously. He has flip-flopped and reinvented himself too many times on too many issues. So I really think it's important that we just put forward our best proposals. We take them as far as we can, and there will be a natural give and take of negotiation that, that will ensue. But uh, those who criticize the House for putting forward our bill in spite of the president calling it dead on arrival, well, you know, if, if we were forced to wait for his green lighting of anything we're allowed to do, we'd never get off the starting line. So uh, I think we got to keep pushing, and I'm glad we did. Okay, so a couple people continue to ask this question about Point Reyes uh, National Seashore and uh, your supposed support of agriculture and pollution, possible pollution <laughs> that's resulting from these ranchers in the um, national parks. So would you like to talk a little bit about your position there? Yeah, we, we talk about this uh, pretty regularly in, in our public forums. So look, right now the Park Service is uh, in the middle of a management pro uh, proceeding management planning process where they will decide whether about two dozen family ranches and dairies that have been um, in the National Seashore area for many generations will be allowed to continue having permits. Uh, they occupy about 30 percent of the National Seashore. And Congress set this up as a pastoral zone that would help preserve the working landscape history and culture that was a big part of West Marin and the creation of this national seashore. But not everybody likes it, and I understand that. Uh, in particular, uh, folks who are opposed to animal agriculture have really mounted a highly organized campaign to push in public comments to the, the NEPA process and to try to end the permits that allow these uh, family ranchers and dairies to continue. Uh, I think they should be allowed to continue. I think it's consistent with the original intent of setting up this unit of the National Park Service. I think it's necessary for local food systems. Not everybody is a vegan right now, and good for everybody who is, but if we're still going to have meat and dairy, 
I would like to see us get it from local sustainable sources and not rely on these massive industrial scale. You want to talk about pollution, uh, relying exclusively on these concentrated industrial scale facilities, uh, which happen to be hotbeds of COVID-19 right now as well, uh, is a bad idea. And I hope that's something we learn from this pandemic. So I believe in local food systems. I believe in holding everybody to high environmental standards. And I believe in honoring the original intent, I believe, of the seashore by giving these folks a chance to continue. Okay, we have time for about two more questions. Julie wants to know, do any of the COVID bills provide college loan debt relief? Um, yes, uh, the CARES Act provides some deferment for student loans, and uh, we have done even more of that in the HEROES Act. So um, stay tuned. We will see if we can't fight for more uh, loan forgiveness and, uh, and deferments uh, as part of our next response. Okay, a number of people are asking how they can support the HEROES Act and the post office. What can your constituents do? So I believe there's a website that has been set up for people who want to advocate for the Postal Service. Gosh, I wish I had the name of it right off the top of my head, but I, I think I'm going to ask my staff to post the link uh, on my Facebook page. So after we're done here, check back on Facebook and, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test the incredible talent of my team uh, back in Washington. I think they can come up with it, but uh, we'll get you that information. It really is important that we fund the Postal Service, not just so we can have mail-in balloting, but because I, I can't imagine this country without a United States Postal Service. It's been with us since before we were a country. It's in the Constitution. I think it's the only federal agency that is expressly called for in the United States Constitution. It does so many good things from employing veterans to increasingly these days uh, supporting commerce and getting seniors who are shut in the medication they need, allowing uh, our letter carriers to check in on shut-ins and, and others who are medically fragile and living alone. Uh, it's just a wonderful institution and I think we need it today more than ever. Okay, so this is our last question. Patty wants to know, when do you think it might be okay to hug grandmas again? And will it not be until 100% of the people are tested? Well, I don't want to say 100% of the people tested. That's probably a point that we're never going to get to. Um, but I think right now, uh, if you want to uh, love your grandparents, it's, it's really good to find a way to do it with at least six feet of distance, I'm sorry to say. Uh, especially if you have been out and about. Now, if you're living with them and they're part of your family circle that you're sheltering in place with, that's another thing. But uh, if you're just visiting, and especially if you're visiting them in a, a congregate living facility, some kind of senior housing or nursing home, uh, that distance is, is critically important. So uh, it's not pleasant, none of us like it, uh, but all the public health experts are telling us that w we've got to find a way to to love our family members and our, and our grandparents uh, while also protecting them. Okay, gotta sign out. That uh, brings us to the end, folks. Hey, thanks for great questions. Really thank you for spending time with me uh, each week and for your patience as we work through the bugs of Facebook Live. And who knows what it's gonna throw at us next week. We'll see, I hope you join us next week. Thanks.